These aren't the stories your mother told you. No, these are the other stories. <laughs> <laughs> Today's episode of The Other Stories is Footprints, written by Amanda M. Blake and narrated by Justin Fife. When it snows here, the mountains with their unpaved roads and steep inclines become impassable. The world as I know it narrows into a snow globe of reality, the cabin an oasis of wood smoke and warmth. But there's nothing like getting snowed in to stifle a restless seven-year-old who wants to play in the snow until he can't feel his nose. And after enough days of trying to entertain that restless seven-year-old safe and warm inside, my mother finally bundled me in underlayers, coat, scarf, hat, and gloves, and threw me outside like old clothes on the burn heap. Playing in the snow always seemed like a better idea when you're not in it, but at that age, I had my own portable heater in my little child's body especially when insulated under all those clothes, and I was capable of a sense of wonder. I made snowmen, snowwomen, and snow castles, using feed buckets when I wanted a hefty keep. The wet snow was like wet sand, good for construction, with a satisfying crunch under my snow boots and the trowel I used as a shovel. But eventually, even playing in the yard felt as though the world had narrowed like an iris and sun we hadn't seen in days, all mist beyond. The overcast sky was as bright as the snow that blew it down on us, white instead of a rainstorm gray or clear blue. It felt like it would be bright forever, like time didn't exist. After lunch, I was toasty from tomato soup and hot cocoa. I thought nothing of putting my trapper hat on the snowman and running down the hill to the tree line of high branch pine around our property, out of the view of the house. You have to understand, we grew up half feral, with a curfew by sunset instead of by streetlights. Dark was actually dark here, winter less so because of the moon's reflection on ice and snow, but when the sky was overcast, there was no moon. Mama and Dad didn't want us out on the mountain after dark without adult supervision, and even grown men could get twisted around in the woods. They worried about exposure, about coyotes and wolves, about bears, Winter made the bears scarce, but the coyotes and wolves hungry. And Mama had nightmares about us freezing to death in the dark, in a ditch on the side of a dirt road for good measure. But when it was light out, we could go just about anywhere on the mountain. Mama and Dad had taken us to every major landmark, from the catfish pond and lumber and hay barn, to the pig barn, to the cow pasture, to the nearest neighbors, to Uncle Wyatt's crumbled old house that everyone said was haunted, and all of us kids were expected to find our way home from each of them. So if we'd done our chores, and we came home when the sun started setting on the other side of the mountain, we could go anywhere we liked. My brothers and sisters were too old to play in the snow for more than 15 minutes, and certainly didn't play with their baby brother, who was annoying in every way to their teenage selves. So, half feral and alone, I picked up and threw buckeyes and pine cones at the tree trunks, made snowballs the size of my head to hit the boulders, which I pretended were trolls, jumped into the snow drifts like I jumped into leaf piles in autumn. I followed the coated footprints of rabbits and the dragging lines of raccoons. On the other side of the pines, the woods opened into another clearing. During summer, it was high with golden grass that concealed copperheads, but at autumn's end, Dad mowed the grass down, leaving it bald, pristine stretch of white blanket under a winter storm. I stood at the edge of the clearing, puzzled at large amorphous patches of black mud all the way across. During spring, summer, even autumn, sounds cacophonize into a natural white noise, but when winter blows with a foot of snow, you're reminded just how loud the forest usually is and just how quiet the forest is during winter. Not silent, there were other quiet crunches of footsteps, the thwump of snow falling from branches and pine needles, the subtle shatter of ice, and the low chant of wind blowing between the mountains, groaning the trees shivering the pine needles. Not silent, but 
unearthly quiet. Too quiet for a seven-year-old boy. I hopped like bunnies, leaving my own small dark melt behind me, then splooshed into the big mud puddle, investigating it like a tide pool. But everything was crushed into obscurity, and the most fun came from discovering how many times it took to hop from one melt to the next, then how much I could splash the black mud onto the snow around it. That entertained me all the way to the other side of the clearing, where tree trunks had been knocked over, as though struck by lightning, except there was no burn, and there hadn't been any thunder in the last storm. I looked behind at the other side of the clearing. Other trees with branches thicker than my arm had been snapped like twigs. It reminded me of that one year that a tornado tore through the McLeod's mountain, leaving a scar of chaotic kindling down its cheek. There hadn't been any thunder during the last storm, and I thought the clearing would be messier if a tornado had gone through. Curious, I sank into the cover of the bare canopy, running through the black melt that continued on the forest floor. Although the snow was shallower here, the edges of the melt less defined. At the end of the patch of woods and into the next clearing, the black melt became clearer, sharper, indentations more obviously part of a pattern, but it was too close to the ground to tell what it was meant to be. Nevertheless, the cows lowed placidly over the crest of the hill, so I wasn't afraid as I continued to follow the black melt zigzagging from one to the other and connecting them with my tiny footprints that would disappear under the steady, soft snowfall long before white would subsume the black melt. On the other end of the pasture, the barbed wire fence had been plastered into the mud. I'd have to go tell Dad and Joshua that they needed to repair that portion of the fence, or else the wolves were going to get in or cows were going to get out again. I tiptoed between the barbed wire and into the woods that led to the creek valley, although the creek was frozen this time of year. Within the deep, icy silence, there was a crunch, not dissimilar to my boots in the snow, magnified, and the crash of falling trees. The light was dimming. It was always subtle at first, and that subtle dimming should have been the signal to go home, because once it started, night fell fast in winter, an ambush hunter. But I was curious, and fearless and immortal, so I darted into the darkening woods, then into the brighter bare line of the valley. Losing light like snow disappearing on eyelashes, I had a clear vista to where the black melts ended, or rather, where they were created, one ponderous, earth-shuddering step at a time by the massive feet of what shambled down the side of the mountain. It was black as the mud, or maybe that was just the nightfall setting over its black-like coat, although its dense, coarse fur meant it wouldn't need one. I didn't have an analog at the time, but since then I would say it resembled yak, bison, or grizzly fur, thick pelt designed for more frigid lands than it traversed. The fur thickened into a spiky mane over its hunched back. Its long arms, which ended with long fingers tipped with claws as long and dangerous as cliffside icicles, nearly scraped the ground, but they swung with an odd grace for its size, in the same way that its steps were proportionately delicate. It tiptoed through the forest, its breath a train engine cloud from its elongated nose. I stopped dead when I saw it. And even though I believed in the Easter Bunny, God, Santa Claus, ghosts, the Tooth Fairy, anything that my parents told me and that my brothers and sisters assured me were real. For a moment, I didn't even believe what I saw. Because I don't know where it had come from, or where it was going, or what it wanted, or what it pretended, I, I still don't. But the thing I remember most clearly is when it turned around to look at me. Little me, who couldn't even feel its footsteps whose steps in the snow were smaller to it than the rabbits to me, whose breath clouded his vision but not enough to obscure, who couldn't move even if I'd wanted to. It breathed out like a bull, but its teeth were interlocked sharp between billows of steam. The muscles underneath its bulk flexed with the twist of its hulking body, and deep within the gleaming darkness of its eyes burned its own furnace, far more effective than mine red as chokeberry or a splash of 
blood and the black melt. I wasn't even a mouthful. It had bypassed a pasture of more substantial cattle, but for a moment, I was sure that it would thunder back up the mountain to snatch me in its thornbush claws and then swallow me into the heat of the billowed smoke from its mouth. Should have listened to Mama, she would have put on my epitaph, over winter rigid soil in which nothing would be buried. Instead, it twisted around again, putting me at its back. Then it continued its deliberate, slouching journey down the side of the mountain. When I turned to run home as fast as I could, I saw its footprints so clearly in the snow. It had passed not 50 feet from our cabin. I told Mama the truth, because I knew better than to lie. I didn't want dessert that night anyway. I curled up under the three quilts on my bottom bunk, staring wide-eyed into the black on the other side of the window glass, afraid that if I drifted off, I would blink myself awake, and the blood-red furnace of a black hole would be staring back at me. But I did fall asleep, as exhausted seven-year-old boys are wont to do. I woke up to a bright snow-spread morning under a white sky, and although the trees were still broken or fallen, there were no more traces of giant footsteps on the virgin snow, except what I brought with me. I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Other Stories. Footprints was written by Amanda N. Blake, narrated by Justin Fife, edited by Duncan Muggleton, and immediate by Duncan Muggleton and Tom Robson, and sound effect provided by freesound.org. The episode illustration was provided by Luke Spooner of Carry On House. A quick thanks to our community managers, Joshua Boucher and Jasmine Arch, and to Joshua Boucher and Karen and Brian for helping with our submission reading. And of course to Ben Errington, the kraken of content creation, emerging from the deep seas, tentacle first, slimy, and with a socially conscious marketing strategy. Amanda M. Blake is a cat-loving daydreamer and mid-aged goth who loves geekery of all sorts, from superheroes to horror movies, urban fantasy to unconventional romance. Amanda M. Blake is the author of such horror titles as Nocturne and Deep Down and the fairy tale mashup series Thorns. For more, visit amandamblake.com. Justin Fife is a voice actor and podcaster, and follow him on Twitter at, at JustinB5. The Other Stories is a production of the Story Studio Hawk and Cleaver and is brought to you with a Creative Commons attribution, no commercial, no derivatives license. That means don't change it, don't sell it, but by all means, share the hell out of it. So, until next time.